Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Pitch. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. The Pitch is one of my favorite shows that we do on Stock Charts TV because it's all about actionable ideas. We bring on three guest experts, each pitching five different ideas, stocks, ETFs, wherever they are led to uh, pick using the best practices of technical analysis. Let's bring on our three guests and get a little sense of what they're looking at. I want to start with Mark Newton at Fundstrat Global Advisors. Mark, you've been on the pitch before. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much, Dave. Great to be back. All right, uh, expert number two, we have Joe Rabel of Rabel Stock Research coming to us from the Washington, D.C. area. Joe, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for being, I'm glad to be here. And then finally, we have Dave Landry, founder of uh, DaveLandry.com, coming to us from the New Orleans area. Dave, welcome back to the pitch. Thank you, Dave. Glad to be back. So what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to go through each of our picks one by one. We're going to talk about what the uh, the name is, what the ticker is. I have some charts available to kind of go through it. Sort of an interesting environment for us, right? And, and uh, when we get to the discussion section, I'm going to ask you guys about the challenge of picking five stock and ETF ideas in this particular environment. But let's get to our first pick. Mark Newton, we're going to start with you. As the S&P, the major average is testing resistance we have to be somewhere. Let's start with ISRG in the healthcare space. What's the thesis here? Well, Dave, a lot of my uh, reason for picking this had to do much more with, I guess, weekly or monthly charts than really what the stock did yesterday. And so you know, this has been one of the strongest stocks within the entire healthcare space since March. And we've had a rise from 220 about about $100 rise just uh, in the last couple of months alone. Um, you know, many would argue that it has gotten overbought, but yet, you know, the weekly trends are still in great shape. Uh, medical devices is my pick for really one of the best parts of healthcare right now. And we're entering seasonally, you know, a very bullish time for the sector between now and July. So, you know, I like this a lot. I, I think that you really use weakness like we're seeing uh, between yesterday and potentially over the next couple of days as a chance to buy dips. I think the stock likely is going to rally back to test uh, all-time highs up above 350. So, you know, I like in particular the fact that we got up above, you know, those prior peaks that we saw back in December of last year. And so, yeah, that was right around, say, 280 or so. We saw a really nice gap on great volume. And, you know, my thinking is that this should materialize like a five-wave uh, rally back to new all-time highs. So, you know, really in this thesis, you can't really get under 290, but any dips in my view, should be viable. And, you know, certainly above 320 would provide a pretty clear, uh, you know, runway for this to, to make some further progress up towards uh, all-time highs. I love how you sort of uh, are thinking about the weekly time frame first. And I think that's an interesting point, Mark, you know, relating some of the short-term weakness we're seeing just this week versus some of the longer-term trends. And I should make a point to everyone watching. We're using sort of a new format of charts here, just so you know what we're looking at. On the right half of the chart is our long-term weekly chart. We'll use this for each of our, uh, our guest picks. The bottom left is a daily chart. And I'll be zooming in and out of each of those. I'll try to highlight where I'm, uh, where I'm at, just so you know. And in the upper left, this is just a candle chart, just to show the most recent data, particularly right now as we have the major indexes testing resistance, as we have a lot of uh, fluidity. Uh, great to sort of see the interplay between these different uh, time frames. Joe, can we go to you with your first pick? We're going to CSIQ. So we're in the uh, technology sector, a solar stock. Yes. And uh, so this one is a little bit different than the others that I have today. Um, I'm, I'm really looking bigger picture here. And what you can sort of see it developing, especially on your chart on the right there on the weekly, where it's uh, it's forming a little cupping pattern here. But what's interesting is I actually um, started with the TAN, which is the ETF mm. for the solar and it caught my eye when I looked at a quarterly chart. So hmm. I'm looking at this huge move to the upside, which shows up on the CSI cube on the move from April of 2020 up till the peak in early 2021. And, and then you've gone, basically made this monster move to the upside with very strong momentum. And now you're cupping around. And essentially it looks like a pullback 
on a long-term quarterly chart mm. and on the monthly chart, it's just starting to turn back up. So I don't, I rarely look at those charts in this way, but I'm sort of trying to find something that you could really kind of follow, sink your teeth into. So if we can get this thing through 50, um, especially if there's improvement in the solars in general, I think this is one that could lead out of the gates. It's so interesting to me that both uh, Mark and Joe, both of you guys have talked about sort of going a little longer term with your with your now. I mean, both of you do a great job of thinking about the the different time frames at, at all times, but particularly now where there's a lot of noise. Good reminder to think about those long term trends. That's super helpful, you guys. Dave, can we bring you in the mix and bring up your first pick, BLDR? This is a building materials name in the industrial sector. Yeah, Dave, uh, what happened here is the material construction stocks, MNC stocks, have been doing really well, and they got hit fairly hard a couple days ago. And what I'm looking for here is this is a super strong, strong trend, and this is what I call a trend knockout. A trend knockout knocks out the weak hands. It knocks out the Johnny-come-latelys, and sometimes it'll even knock out the longer-term trend followers. And if the trend resumes, so let's say we get to let's about 120 or so, which would be the higher that knockout bar, that would be a good entry on this one and maybe stop out down below that the wide range TKO bar, the trend knockout bar would be a good uh, place to stop out. The beauty of a TKO, especially when it closes poorly like the one in DLDR, is sometimes they just keep on dropping and you never trigger. So no capital gets put into harm's way. And that's one thing that I, I do like about this really simple setup. It's, it's a fascinating chart. And one of the stronger, I mean, th this particular group, right, Building Materials has been one of the stronger groups. This is, BLDR has been uh, at times the top ranked stock in our entire large cap universe using the, uh, the stock charts technical ranking. So very interesting that you would bring this up as a, uh, as a first idea. That's awesome, Dave. Thank you so much. Mark, can we go back to you for pick number two, going into semiconductors, ON. What's the goal here? Well, this is one of the strongest stocks within the entire semiconductor space. And this group, uh, you know, did experience some weakness in April, but on largely avoided a lot of the weakness. If you look at the chart on the far right, your longer term weekly, you see it has continually moved up within an ongoing uptrend of higher highs, higher lows, really very little overall evidence of deterioration. So, you know, I do like making use of mild weakness like we've seen in the last couple of days as a chance to buy this name you know, right near $80, I think we, you know, likely get up towards 90 to 92, uh, which is really if you were to create a channel just on the price action since early 2022 over highs and lows, and that really is right up towards the upper part of that uh, channel. So mm. you know, until this group really starts to roll over in bigger fashion, it, it's certainly still something I want to participate in. And uh, you know, NVIDIA is a little stretch for me. ON is really my pick. I think it looks a little bit better, relatively speaking, and is a little bit better risk reward. Uh, no one boldly picking NVIDIA on an earnings day today, but I, I, I get the pick on ON. That's a, dec that's a decent pick. And, and certainly a group, Mark, that's been one of the stronger groups uh, of all of them. You address it a little bit, but you know, what do you, how, do you, uh, how do you handle something like this, a group that has been so strong? Because I know a lot of people struggle in an environment where a trend like this just keeps going higher, how do you stay with this and avoid selling too early on a stock that's worked so consistently <laughs> like an ON, right? Well, I can advise others on that probably a little better than I do on my own. Uh, <laughs> I'm guilty of the same you know, bad tendencies of probably taking profits too quickly or, or buying dips when I shouldn't. But yeah, look, as long as this continues to trade up, I would really use that mm. prior swing low and say, you know, if you're involved in this on an intermediate term basis, depending on your risk tolerance or time horizon, you know, you, you really still, it really hasn't given you any reason to avoid it. So yeah. if anything, dips are still viable until you see at least a swing low violated. I, I vividly remember the first time I went into a portfolio manager's office and told them we should sell a name because it had hit an objective. And he said, why would I sell this name? It's doing so well. And I never forgot that lesson. It's a great, great point, uh, Mark. Thanks for saying that. Uh, Joe, let's bring you in with pick number two, FLNC. This is Fluence Energy. Uh, it's a utility name. Yeah, it. well, it, it does say it's utilities, right? It's a, but it's it a utility and air quotes name. <laughs> it actually has an AI component to it. Mm. And I think that's why it's getting a little uh, play here. Um, so this one's a lot simpler than the CSIQ for me. I, I'm looking at, you know, a pretty 
strong move off the low on the daily chart uh in your upper left you can really see it really well or with that chart yeah uh you know strong move to the upside um make a higher high and the pullback has been very mild so what i like to do is measure the strength of the up move i like to make sure it's going to you know trending making a higher high like that but mm. I, i'm also measuring using momentum uh, typically adx i want to get a good reading in adx and and hopefully have MACD confirm. And then on the pullback, I actually go to a smaller time frame. So if this is a daily, I'd go down to the hourly and I would just say, I want to make sure on the pullback, I'm not showing a lot of strong momentum to the downside. And in, mm. in this case, it's kind of meeting both of those criteria. So I just like to see this take out the high from yesterday, actually, just make a little a W pattern and, and uh, take out that prior peak. And I think that would be a pretty good uh, setup here. It's so interesting because a, a number of these names have had pretty good runs, but, you know, pulling back in the short term, right? A lot of these names that have done very, very well, kind of pulling back and potentially giving a good entry point. Uh, really good, really good uh, point about the short term support there as well, uh, Joe. That's a great, great pick number two. Um, and I was all excited. I saw utilities. I'm thinking someone getting defensive, <laughs> but thank you for making a, a technology pick through utilities. That's what I think yeah, you managed to do. Exactly. Well, well done. Well done. Um, Dave, let's bring on your second pick, which is Hook, H-O-O-K. This is a uh, healthcare name. What's the idea here? Yeah, this is a stock that kind of died forever, and then it based out for a while, and it's kind of rising from the ashes. It's similar to what I call a Phoenix strategy, where you're looking to buy these stocks, not as they're hitting new lows, but when they begin to really rally off the lows. And it's cut through a lot of overhead supply, if you look at the weekly chart there. So I think that's a pretty good thing with this it's a super speculative stock obviously a cheap stock but it uh it's set up as a pullback so maybe an entry about uh let's say 165 or so if it begins to rally out of that pullback if it doesn't rally don't touch it but be warned this is a super speculative stock and very uh, very dangerous so just consider yourself warned on that one mm, interesting and i think what you were talking about just looking at the uh at the short-term chart here um, you know, short term, we have a bit of a support here at the previous lows over the last week or so. But I think you were saying, you know, breaking out of this range to the upside, probably the best indication. Is that right? Yeah, always. Okay. I always buy on strength and and yep. sell on weakness. And and if uh, what's the old uh, saying? No tick, no trade or whatever. No ticky, no trading. So ideally, <laughs> you want to be buying up a little bit when you're buying into something. And if it just continues to pull back, just sit on your hands and let it go. I love it. This this reminds me, there's one of those names, I always call it a watch list names, right? Something maybe not this moment, but it's on the list of charts that I'm going to follow, setting an alert at the highs. A lot of those kind of things can be can be super helpful. Great, great, uh, great chart number two. Mark, let's bring you on for your third pick. We're now, uh, we're staying in technology for you with CDNS, Cadence. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So this has been a really interesting uh, pattern breakout that we've seen in uh, in Cadence Design Systems just in the last couple months. And you see the right hand chart and the fact that this formed, um, you know, really what some would call a, uh, you know, a cup and handle or what have you. You basically had a nice little base and then you really broke out above that on very good volume that happened back in February of this year. And so immediately, uh, you know, that drew me to the stock. If you look at the left uh upper left and you see you know last week actually broke right back out to new all-time high territory and so mm -hmm. you've actually had you know three or four days now of a little bit of a pullback that have occurred on much lesser volume than you saw on the breakout and you know from a structural perspective this is still in excellent shape i don't think it actually gets down under uh you know that 199 level and should actually push back up to near 225 to 230 so i you know i i don't view you know the move from really april into you know, early May is being all that damaging. Technically, it's simply a three wave uh, type decline. And so, mm. you know, I, I still think this has room to go on the upside. It's one of my favorite stocks within the space. So I'm, I'm definitely a buyer on, on weakness. That, I'm so glad you talked about the basing pattern here on the weekly chart. And it's so funny at the uh, at the CMT symposium where I saw you most recently, Ralph Akinpour, I think on the stage said, the broader the base, the higher in space. It was like Arnold Palmer making an Arnold Palmer. I mean, it was that sort of momentous, right. you know, Ralph dropping that sort of uh, comment. But great, I mean, great illustration on the weekly chart of just a long-term consolidation pattern resolving to the upside. That's a great, great example, Mark. Uh, Joe, let's get your third pick uh, up and running, which is PGTI. This is another build building materials name. We talked about a BLDR earlier. What's the idea here? 
Yeah. And, you know, if you look at what BLDR is doing, what's interesting is we've got a market environment that is really not all that great. Frankly, mm -hmm. it's very narrow. But there are some stocks like a BLDR that when they kick into gear, they you, you can make some money in. It's just there's there's not that many of them. So yeah. you kind of want to find the ones that they really want to own. And in this case, you had this base breakout. And what I find interesting is not always on the breakout pattern that I learn what's going on. It's on the pullback or the pause where no one wants mm -hmm. to sell the stock despite all the action in the market being really questionable. I just like how this is paused rather than really giving up anything. There isn't any sellers here. So I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to that. Now, I would probably draw some kind of a downtrend line in some way, shape, or form before I'd be considering getting in this. I want, hmm. like Dave Landry mentioned, I like to buy on strength, even if it's, you know, any kind of little uptick in some way, shape, or form. In this case, you know, you could kind of connect the last two tops and put a trend line in there. And I think uh, I think you'd have a pretty good spot as to where this would kick into gear again. Yeah, great point, though. We're making a new a new high there last month and it's pulled back a bit, but it really hasn't given up much of those gains. It's actually held up remarkably well at a time when the market's getting pretty choppy and un uncomfortable, what some would say. Um, great example there. PGTI is your third pick. We are going to riot blockchain. Dave, thank you for bringing blockchain into the discussion. I would be disappointed if you did not uh, attempt to do so. What's the thesis yeah. with riot? What do you what do you uh, what do you like with this sort of uh, name here? Yeah, I was trying to get uh, something crypto. Uh, we're actually long riot. I'm personally long and my clients are long riot at this particular time, but it hasn't done a whole lot since. And we got long way back in the pullback you know, on the daily chart. And back then, cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin, were doing a little bit better, obviously. Hmm. And since then, it's kind of going sideways. But I, I think maybe a breakout above 13 might be worth going after it. One thing that sort of impresses me with Riot is Bitcoin's been really lackluster, and I think it's down like 3.5% today. And Riot just kind of hangs in there. And I think that's kind of interesting. And and uh, maybe it's uh, in, into wishing, as Sakota says, but maybe <laughs> it's kind of like uh, it, it kind of feels like the ball being pushed underwater. And if, if uh, and big a lot of ifs in this sentence, but if Bitcoin begins a rally a little bit, I really think this one will take off. But obviously, if you're already in it, you stops. We have stops in place in case we're wrong. But I think it I think it still has potential. It, it hasn't done anything wrong. And it's 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 consolidating after a really nice trend. So I still think it's worth a shot. Really interesting. I love that metaphor, pushing the ball underwater. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that, but I will, I will give you full credit when I use that one. That's a great one, actually, and great illustration of a name that's not struggled when you could see the argument why it, why it arguably should have. Uh, Mark, let's bring on your fourth pick. We're making some good progress here. We have Pfizer, PFE, obviously a big uh, ph pharmaceutical name. What's the thesis here? So it's really three parts, Dave. A lot, first is really the seasonality play on just healthcare between now and July. Uh, this group is a defensive play, so those that are concerned about the market can consider that. You look at the lower left-hand side and the fact that Pfizer recently just broke out of this five-month downtrend on really the highest volume we've seen in over a year. Uh, so that's really interesting to me. Initially, uh, the right-hand side of the chart, the weekly, if you can really stretch that out a little bit and get a feeling uh, from really going back since 2009, if you can. So the stock has had a, you know, a tremendous long-term history of success. But as everybody knows, uh, you know, it largely has gone sideways, mm. uh, if not down from the early part of last year at a time when some pharmaceutical names like Merck and Lilly have done quite well. And a lot of that was, you know, pressures of whether it's still a vaccine company or something else. And recently they've tried to buy Seijin you know, this this cancer uh, biotech that hopefully the FTC commissioner will weigh in positively on that. But when you look at the just the degree of the slope of if you can just zoom in short term again, I mean, the pullback has been two equal legs down of about 20 points a piece and you're down to really the mid 30s. And now you've seen a really decent move off the lows on, on great volume. So uh, at least for me, that's enough to get involved. I do have a, a small position and I'll increase that if we get up above those prior swing lows near 42. Uh, I think, you know, long-term basis, if you go back since 1999, 2000, this broke out of, you know, two decade highs, long, long-term cup and handle, as did a lot of different pharmaceutical stocks. And this one just has been under pressure. But I see this group as being, you know, a phenomenal area for the long-term. And, uh, you know, just given the aging demographics and, and 
you know, particularly this time of year, uh, some of these pharmas should really start to come to life. And so I, I like the recent price action and also how it fits in with the longer term picture. Mm, I love you hit on so many great little nuggets there uh, with the different uh, time frames, the long term thesis, uh, but how it's pulled back in the uh, in the short term. You also mentioned seasonality. When we get to the discussion, I want to bring that up a little bit more because we're certainly at a, at a key seasonal moment, arguably for for stocks and for healthcare in particular, sort of at that time of year when it tends to uh, work a better than better than normal. Uh, Joe, let's bring in your fourth pick, which is ServiceNow, ticker N-O-W. This is a software name. What's the idea here? Yeah, so uh, one of the things I wanted to do is uh, just kind of mention, so I, I like to look at a monthly chart to give a really big picture look at it. And in this case, and there's a lot of stocks that fit this um, situation, which is that I think they're trading moves. They're short to intermediate term trading moves. When I look at a monthly chart, it does not look like it's ready to start another big trend. Mm. But that doesn't mean we can't get a, like I say, like a short to intermediate term move that you can play off the weekly or the daily and catch a leg to the upside. And this looks like it's in position to do that. I mean, if you go back and look at the daily chart now, um, We've we've gotten a little mini breakout here and we're starting to pull back to the breakout area. So, um, again, a lot of this has to do with how orderly the pullback is so far. This has been very orderly. It's not, you know, it's the kind of look I like to see the strength to the upside. And then we're pulling back right to basically where we broke out from. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if we make any kind of a hook pattern here where we can just kind of form a little uh, cup here. I think trigger back to the upside that it could really be in position to play for a month or two. It's a, such a great chart. It reminds me there are a number of charts that kind of have this inverted head and shoulders kind of look where you feel like if they get a little bit higher, right, if they follow through, all of a sudden that's a monster breakout uh, potentially, right, if you if you use the traditional measuring technique. Great example there from ServiceNow and a different, different chart than some of the ones we've looked at so far. QQQ. Uh, let's talk about this one, Dave. What is it that attracts you to this area? Certainly, I mean, been one of the stronger parts of the market year to date. Why is it a good idea at this point? Well, I have a system called the TFM 10% system that I use in the S&P 500 cash market. And I put it on the Qs because the Qs were stronger. And it, it does perform fairly well. And basically, you're just looking to get in the queues, when you have two weeks of upside Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the 50 simple moving average. Mm. And when you were you're within, he tried to say 10% of the 50 week closing high. And uh, the NASDAQ, believe it or not, is within 10% of its 50 week closing high now. So I wouldn't rush out. I'm long from 319.50. I wouldn't rush out and buy it on this weakness. But now it's pulled back a little bit. I think if it began to rally, I think it'd be a good uh, a good buy just because it remains stronger. Now, if it pulls back into the base, you want to use some other technical analysis, by all means, wait for it to get back out of the base. But for now, while it's pulling back, I think it it, it has potential. Mm. I don't know if it's a great if a blessing or a curse that we're doing this on a day when we're seeing such weakness. It's uh, I'll, I'll say it's a blessing in, <laughs> for all of you guys, but I know it can, be, it can be challenging in this sort of environment for sure. Having said that, what I love is all three of you on your own volition came up with a short idea and uh, brought it with you. So I'd love to go one, two, three, and just talk about some potential downside ideas. Mark, you suggested uh, shorting China, FXI. What's the idea here? Gapping down again today, right? Yeah, it has, Dave. So, you know, yesterday was a day this really came on the radar because it broke down out of this shorter term triangle formation that really had been ongoing for the last few months. And so, mm -hmm. you know, volume expanded. That was a big negative for me. Uh, today, it's actually breaking down to new almost six month lows. So we're actually getting down under not only the prior lows from April, but also in mid-March. So this will bring it down to the lowest levels we've seen since potentially last November. And it closes down on its lows. And I, you know, I don't think there's much in the way of this going down to you know, anywhere between, you know, 25, 68, which would be really a Fibonacci retracement, 61.8 of the entire rally up from October to exactly up to January. Uh, also, if you measure the distances, the waves of the first move down. Um, just since, you know, early this year, then that gets it down to really right near 2612 will be. So I, I think it has about 5% mm. down. I mean, obviously today is a big head start for people that were not on board, uh, you know, that, that obviously missed some of this downside. But, uh, you know, China has attempted to, uh, you know, restart their economy. And, and obviously we know some of the data has come in weaker of late. 
consumers going gangbusters, but the manufacturing side is, is real weak. And so I, I still think that's going to weaken into the month of June. Uh, I like being short China. Yeah, continue to rotate lower. I feel like, you know, not too long ago, it's sort of a question mark, right, as to which way this resolves. It seems like maybe that question mark is more of a period or an exclamation point as it's breaking down out of that base to the downside, right? Well, it's, it's funny, and I'll add a little bit, is that, you know, I, I do have some cycles that suggest that it should start to lift in, in June mm -hmm. uh, once we, we sort of flush out to the downside. And so I, I think that there might be eventual reasons to, to take a look at buying this. This is not a, a long-term short by any means, but really over the next three to five weeks, I think that, you know, it probably has about 5% lower. That's perfect. Thank, thanks so much for, uh, for clarifying that, Mark. Uh, let's get Joe to your uh, final pick. This is HIG, Hartford Financial Services. Again, more of a short idea. What's the thesis here? Yeah. So um, the first part here is the fact that it tried to go to a new high mm. uh, just this year and it didn't have any follow through at all. But then notice what happened on the uh, decline phase. You see the strength of the two big bars down on the weekly, I mean, or you can see it on the daily. I mean, mm -hmm. it was this violence to the downside. And now look at the retracement back. So I'm, I'm comparing the momentum of the two moves. Like we got really strong momentum on the way down. And then on the way back up, you can't, I mean, it's just very weak. Now, I know we've seen a lot of weakness in the financials across the board, especially in the banks. Uh, and you could say, well, this is actually held up better. But there's not, the fact is, is that area is still very weak. They're just mm. not showing any signs of strength. So I thought this was worth watching. Now, the way I would handle this is on the daily chart, uh, you can draw in a trend line from the low in March and connect it to the low in May. And I, I would have a trend line there. I think if we can take out that trend line, then I think there's a pretty good chance we're going to work our way back down into the lower 60s. Uh, it's it's again, it's a it's a trading play. I'm not looking for this to fall apart and just, you know, go down for the next year and a half. But yeah. I think you could get a good. I'm trying to play the next leg right in each of these stocks. I'm not necessarily trying to make a major call except for the CSIQ, which, again, is probably a little early. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it's one of the better financial stocks. Dubious honor at this point, right? Being being at the top of the list of financials, by point well taken, and I and I like that illustration of the acceleration to the downside and more of an anemic kind of rally, right? It sort of fits into your thesis very very well. Dave, you have our last pick. This is short an energy stock. This is the only energy idea we have, and it's not on the long side. Talk to us about Valera. Yeah, energies have been a little wide and loose and looking a little toppy in here and valero looks like it, it could be in trouble you could see on the weekly something i'm just kind of noticing as we're talking it has an inverted cup and handle look to it it just looks like it's in a lot of trouble and, and basically my pattern was just looking off the daily you had a sharp break lower then you had a little bit of a retrace and like everything everyone is talking about today you don't want to you want to buy i'm sorry you don't want to short on strength you want to mm. short on weakness so it has kind of crawled higher and higher but maybe if it takes out, let's say, 108 or so, it might be worth a short. And if it keeps crawling higher and keeps going higher, then just leave it alone. But it does have a lot of overhead supply now to deal with. And I think if it uh, if it triggers, it's going to have a hard time uh, going back up. So that's uh, my short pick mm. for this week. You you hit on some really good points just to how to approach this, day, which I really like. I, I always tell people there's three parts. There's the setup, the trigger, and the confirmation. And interesting setup, the trigger, you mentioned like 108, or right? actually rolling over. And that's the, sort of the signal that things are deteriorating. That's a great example. Um, guys, 15 awesome picks, five each of you. Let's go through each of you and just confirm where, uh, where you're uh, aiming us, and then we'll discuss it as a group. Uh, Mark Newton from Fundstrack Global Advisors, you gave us five ideas. ISRG, Intuitive Surgical in the Healthcare Space. ON, a semiconductor name in technology. Staying in technology with CDNS, Cadence. Then we have Pfizer, a mega cap healthcare name of Pharma. And then shorting China with the FXI. Joe Rabel of Rabel Stock Research gave us five ideas as well. Solar to start out with, CSIQ. Then a, a air quote utility name, more of an AI sort of technology play, FLNC. PGTI is a building uh, materials name in, in the industrial sector. ServiceNow, N-O-W in technology. And then we're shorting Hartford, H-I-G, that's in the financial sector. Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com, five ideas as well. In building uh, materials, yet in, in the industrial sector, BLDR, one of the top-ranked names in our own stock chart scooter ranking uh, in 2023. 
Healthcare name, H-O-O-K, more of a speculative play. Riot Blockchain in the technology sector, R-I-O-T. Then he talked about the mega cap technology trade with the QQQ, and then shorting an energy idea, V-L-O, as long as we roll over and get a trigger to, uh, to the downside. Guys, that was interesting. I'd love to just start as we discuss these picks. How hard or how easy was it to come up with five ideas in this sort of environment? And I know the answer from the reaction I think I got from you guys when we were getting ready. But talk to us about the challenges of doing it in this sort of environment. I'll go. <laughs> yeah, Dave, please. <laughs> It's uh, it's been really, really difficult, and and uh, in my in my trading service, I haven't had a setup recommended. I haven't recommended a setup in about a week or so. Yeah, it, it's just really tough. And then and then now you've got the S and P coming back into the soup, so to speak, back to the chop choppy range that it's been in. So that just kind of makes things worse. And I, th- I think it's a really a super stock pickers market where I, I look at two thousand stocks every day, and there's just not a whole lot out there to get excited about. But I am seeing something I wanted to mention earlier, like the speculative biotech issues and speculative health services and drug issues, sort of like that HOOK, beginning to kind of, as I said earlier, rise from the ashes. So it's like the market just can't seem to fire on all eight cylinders. It's like all of a sudden you get a few areas going and then all of a sudden they come right back in. So it's been frustrating Mm. to, uh, as you alluded to. Yeah. For me, Dave, it's really, uh, as you know, I'm a big ADX guy and, um, that what I like about ADX, it tells you the strength of the buyers as well as the strength of the sellers. And right now, we don't really have either one having command in a lot of stocks. I mean, mm. it, there's obviously there are some uh, showing that, but it's if you go through enough stocks, you realize that there's just a lot of waiting going on. There's not a strong, it's not like one side or the other is really taking control. So I found it very difficult to put, you know, to put together some ideas that that I felt were, you know, very timely. Yeah. Mark, how would you grade the challenges of picking these ideas in this sort of environment? Well, look, Dave, I mean, markets like this lend themselves to technical analysis, which we all do. I think that uh, plays to all of our strong suits and we have to keep on top of the sector rotation. Um, you know, we look for stocks that are at or near all time highs and, and largely most of us come up with lists of you know, our top 15, 20 names in many different sectors. And from there, it's just more of a, you know, it takes some time in markets like this that have been range bound for almost three months with regards to the S&P and, and, and technology still quite strong. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. But for now, I have to stick with the, the sectors that are still either strong or ones that I think could be emerging and try to pick from among those. And more based on intermediate term structure than really looking for short term breakouts, given that the market really uh, is still pretty choppy. Joe, given the opportunity to pick any of the FANG stocks, Microsoft, Apple, any of those, you avoided those. And I know, obviously, you've got a lot of different things we could pick. Is there something about when you're looking at things like Apple, NVIDIA, of course, earnings this week, so that's a, that's a tough name to look at. But when you look at names like Apple and Microsoft, uh, what do you do with, in this sort of environment when they've had the run that they've had? Um, and, and what is it that would compel you or would compel you not to pick a name like this? For this uh, for this exercise, yeah, I mean, we could use Apple. Um, I probably if I, if my choice. I probably look at. I, I would say that my favorite is Microsoft in the way in the dynamics. But let's use. Sure. It. <laughs> okay. Well, so we had this drive off the low. Yeah. Right. So I, the only one part of the equation is working for me. This isn't a setup. This is a stock that's shown a strong move off the low, mm. and now we're back up into resistance. So the question is, how, are there sellers? The only way we're going to know that is is through a pause or a pullback over the next, you know, two to four weeks, six weeks, something like that. And I think if it handles itself well in that scenario, that's where I might have an interest in it, but not after it's gone from 210 to 325 or whatever it is, 314 in a short period of time and is now running into resistance. Yeah, it is true with with both of those names, with Apple, with Microsoft, uh, and we've seen it recently with some of the staples names, right? Like Coke, Pepsi, PG, all kind of hitting these big resistance levels. The weekly charts, it almost screams at you. And and uh, and we're all kind of coming off from there. I mean, Mark, does that give you hesitancy about, about going after a name at this point in the cycle? Well, I think it all depends on your time frame, Dave. So mm. yeah, short term, I, I wouldn't be inclined to buy Apple with the stock right up above 170 within striking distance of 176. But yeah. I look for the laggards that are probably trying to play catch up and ones like Amazon, for example, that have just 
broken nearly a year's downtrend that is starting to act a lot better. Uh, mm. So if you look at that, you know, we're and the right hand side of that chart shows you, you know, we've had a pretty decent move and prices have just gotten up above prior highs. So many times I'll look for mean reversion if I feel we're in the latter stage of a move in a certain group. And many of the, the so-called FANG names are, you know, have weekly RSIs that are well up above 70 and many are up near prior levels. They look stretched. And so, yes, maybe that has a a, a big message for the market. And then we might see consolidation because this this group either is going to have to find a way to forge through new all-time highs or, or, you know, many of these might have to consolidate. So uh, for me, it, this becomes a time when you want to look for what's moving aggressively off the lows to really join the pack. Mm, yeah, yeah, great points. Dave, if I could bring you in, you, one of your ideas was Riot Blockchain, which I, I'm so glad that you put put this one in there because it kind of allows us to think about cryptocurrencies and how it relates. I, I think, I mean, arguably still an open question as to whether the, it, these are risk assets or not, right? I mean, I feel like the... The opinion may have changed, but um, given the environment with equities, what is it about that? What about about the crypto space now that draws you to that space or draws you away from that space? Given what we've seen with Bitcoin and Ethereum and others, well, it's interesting about crypto. And, and somebody Sorkin or someone once said, it's like it's either 1995 or 1999, like the Nasdaq <laughs> back then. But I, I argue that we flip from one to the other each day. So every mm. day I'm looking at them to see where the strength is. So right now, Bitcoin is not doing so well. Uh, just a side note, I think that if Bitcoin didn't have all this uh, paper Bitcoin out there, fake Bitcoin, <laughs> all these brokerages not really holding it at all, I yeah. think the Bitcoin would probably quadruple from here. Uh, it, but it's kind of like gold. Same thing's happening there, a lot of derivatives and all. But uh, getting back to the to the, the Riot blockchain, it has gone sideways quite a bit as of late. So that's why I said only buy this one on strength and just not to mm. not to change the subject but you notice like apple and microsoft when you brought them up they've gone sideways for about a month so that's yeah. the net net that i really like to look at one of the most important indicators you can you can look at i believe is where's the price now and go back a few weeks few months few years whatever but right now you've got about a month of sideways action so it has lost momentum so wait for strength on on any uh, buys at this at, especially at this juncture yeah, so I'm I'm uh, using ACP a little more recently. We're using it ex almost exclusively for this particular episode. And one of the features that I added was um, it shows the current price and then a horizontal line to the left. I'm actually finding that incredibly helpful because you yeah. quickly just see where we're at now versus where we've been. That was that was why we called my show the final bar. I always tell people start where we're at and look to the left. And and I think I'm I'm hitting on exactly what you've said. You're seeing that with a lot of the mega cap names, a lot of names that have had runs are sort of hitting those. Uh, um, kind of resistance levels that could be of interest. Um, Mark, if we could, could we pivot a bit and talk about materials? Materials is one sector that was not included at all in our discussion. Gold arguably has had one of the better 2023s around, right? And, and we're looking at the GLD here. Again, another one that's sort of at its its uh, its highs. What is it about the, uh, about the chart of gold that attracts you or pushes you away based on what you're seeing now? A lot of the way I look at currencies and commodities, Dave, is to find other things that correlate well with them or, or, or correlate against them being negative. And, and mm. one thing that I've always noticed is that the move in interest rates and the dollar, you know, tend to go opposite of, of gold. If you see real rates start to, to, to decline, then gold has a really big push higher. And, you know, recently, as rates have been moving up over the last two weeks, that's provided a decent little pullback in gold. Mm. Um, I still like gold and silver on an intermediate term basis. I, I believe it is right to really buy uh, dips in these. I think we're going to have a, a push back to new all-time highs in gold. And I think silver also probably might be the better to own on an intermediate term. And I think that'll also push higher into June. But yeah, they, they are facing some seasonal headwinds. And I, I would probably, you know, for a short-term trade, I would own them for a move to new highs. And then I think you really have to uh, hold off until they consolidate a bit and then really look to buy them in bigger size for an intermediate term. Uh, and that, I mean, probably 12 to 18 months. Um, you can't really own these forever, but you have to really capture the cycle for now. Still short, you know, short term in a downtrend, intermediate term bullish for me. So I'm I'm a buyer of, uh, of dips. Um, Joe, if I could bring you in, I, I know working with institutional investors in general tend to lean away from gold. It's usually an out of benchmark bet. It's kind of a tough one to justify. But do you see enough from a technical perspective to lean into precious metals here, gold, silver and others? Yeah, I mean, I like what's going on, especially if you look at the GLD. I, I mean, I think um, 
I agree with Mark. I mean, I think SLV could be the the bigger play when it's all said and done. But in the near term, if you look at this level, it's bounced up against the third time. The first two times it hit it, it's sold off really hard. Now, we're getting a little bit of a sharp pullback right now, but it's not any to me, at least not yet to the degree that the kind of selling that we saw before. I think this can hold in that, you know, above 180 and kind of consolidate. I think it's prepping for a breakout at some point. Um, mm. the, the long-term picture of this is still in pretty good shape. And some of the better names, uh, a, a stock like WPM or FNV that, that are that looks similar to this GLD, I think are ones to be on the lookout for. Uh, would not take very much for these to break out. Yeah, right. A number of these, right? Sort of right at that point, and short-term pullback across the board with uh, with some of these names, which is uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, Dave, if we could talk a little bit more macro, you had mentioned um, the uh, your ten percent strategy. That's the trend following moron strategy, if I remember correctly. Um, Correct. But, but basically, just keeps you in just a, a a brilliant, just simple reminder of what's the larger trend. When you're looking at the S and P, of course, testing forty two hundred, we're sort of stalling out this week. How much of that macro strength or weakness informs your picking of some of the ideas we've talked about today? Well, not a, I, basically, I, I do a bottom-up approach. I looked at the setup yeah. at setups first. So if I really like something, it doesn't matter what the market is doing. Ideally, it's you want the market and the sector to confirm what's happening. And but lately, the database sort of regulates itself. So listen to the database is what I often preach. And I'm just not seeing a whole lot of setups to get to get really excited about. So it's not so much a macro view other than I am long the queues because they look kind of interesting. And uh, I guess what I'm kind of hoping, I know I just use the word hope, but I'm hoping that narrow leadership begins to broaden out. Everybody and their brother's talking about this, this breadth being really bad in the market. Mm. And I was kind of hoping some new leaders would emerge to jump into the fray on that. But basically, as far as that signal and taking that signal, I just wanted to practice what I preach and show that I actually wanted to uh, take a, um, a position there and we'll just see how it works, good, bad, or indifferent. Joe, what would you what would you say to that in terms of the the macro environment and, and particularly that idea of narrow leadership? I know a lot of people are talking about the, the weaker breadth, the lack of support from other parts of the market. How big of a factor is that for you now in May of 2023 looking at these markets? Yeah, so um, be, I'm a bottom-up guy, too. I yeah. mean, I come to a conclusion on the market by looking at a whole bunch of stocks. So I do have an mm. opinion on the market. I'm not just, I, I mean, I agree with Dave. If I see something that just meets everything that I look for, I want to I want to do it, uh, regardless of what the market looks like. That's hard to find right now. But more important to me is I, I'm going bottom-up by set, and then I'm looking at sectors, and I'm looking, and, you know, mo working my way up by looking at lots of stocks. And the problem I've got is in doing this for 32 years, it's very rare for the stocks not to lead. Like usually mm -hmm. I'm early, I'm seeing stuff and saying, hey, you know, this this is market is starting to look a lot better here uh, underneath the surface. If you look under the hood and then the market breaks out, it's pretty rare for the market to break out and then everything plays catch up to that. Uh, so I'm not saying it can't happen, that it, we can expand. I think we just gotta be careful and make sure that what you're uh, you know, just you're not just hopeful here. It's it's got to mm -hmm. be, and I kind of think if we're getting through 4200, it's not going to be a stealth breakout. It, we're going to know it. It's going to go through it like you know, violently. And mm -hmm. um, it, I think if we're starting something meaningful to the upside, it, it could be one of those breakouts. We have to make a stock charts TV special logo, right? The big 30 point headline. I'll let you know when we do that, so you guys know it's been <laughs> announced. Mark, could we bring a little bit of seasonality into this? You mentioned with the healthcare name about some seasonal strength this time of year. You know, seasonal tendencies are right at that sell and may go away kind of time when we all get asked about it. How much is seasonality a factor in what we're seeing now, do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. May has held up a lot better than I think a lot of people had thought might be possible. And I think a lot of that has to do with just pre-election year seasonality, which the first and the second quarter tend to be the best parts of the entire Four year cycle. But, you know, I would argue that we're close to exiting that. And we should begin, you know, potentially a period where the next four or five months, you know, if we're going to see our, you know, any sort of pullback that it likely happens between now and, and October. And so, you know, you just have to be wary of, of group rotation and what's happening. I would also argue, you know, breadth is low just because markets have gone nowhere since February, at least the S&P. It's really been large cap tech that's been holding us up. And so, yeah, we need to see that breath expansion and groups like financials, industrials, healthcare, 
really start to surge. And, and that's, you know, it's arguable that we've seen that enough to really give us a lot of conviction yet. You know, I don't look at 4,200 as being as big as really 4,325 up near last August highs. And I mm. think that is actually going to be, you know, we could actually get up above briefly 4,200, uh, but we still might stall out near the 43 and a quarter level, which is a, a little bit bigger level for me. Uh, sentiment is is definitely something that always enters the equation. For me, I still see people as being very flat-footed and offsides, and that gives me a lot of confidence that we likely will not move to new lows this year. I think that even if we have a pullback, um, you know, th this whole indecision uncertainty is going to turn to fear very quickly and likely provide a decent cushion for the market. You know, if we get to near 3,900 or even 3,800 or into the fall, that would be a chance to to really buy into that for me. It's only if you exit get below 3,800, I think is would be really problematic. You mentioned that uh, that August high. That's also a Fibonacci level too, as I'm, right. I'm sure you exactly. know, right? That's yep. a, I think yep. that's a 61.8% retracement yeah. back up there. So yeah, it's sort of that con and that that's what concerns me, right? We break above 4,200. There's like yet another significant level, right? Just above where we're at, it feels like. Well, if you look at the prior peak back in May, I mean, that 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 actually surpassed the prior high that we saw back in the spring. So there's no mm. saying that we were breaking it. It's going to be this big breakout that, that likely would get a lot of people on board at the time they don't want to be in, on board because the breath, <laughs> unless we really pick up very rapidly, even a breakout is likely going to be probably a chance to sell into June unless you really see a very broad based rally. Dave, you had mentioned uh, with with a couple of your charts, sort of this idea of the trigger concept, right? I guess is what I would yeah. call it, which is we're setting up, but this is what I would need to see. How I know a lot of people, we have a lot of new investors, a lot of new traders in the last couple of years, sort of since the COVID era. And I would argue that many of them sort of take action first and then figure out the plan after. That's sort of a like classic rookie mistake when you're trading. How do you stay patient in this sort of environment where you're just waiting for setups to happen, there's just such a temptation to jump in and just do something just to see if that works. Well, there is a temptation there, and I'm I'm probably doing too much. Uh, we were talking offline about zero DTE options. I'm probably doing <laughs> too much of that stuff to keep me uh, just because I'm bored, you know, waiting for uh, setups. But it, it does take a tremendous amount of patience. And, and as far as waiting for the entries, everybody wants to try to get a bargain. Everybody new to trading. And uh, I'm doing a series on Jesse Livermore, as you know, and one of the things he talks yeah. about is scaling in. I'm not a big fan of scaling in because of the way I trade, because I'm taking partial profits on a swing trade and then trailing a stop higher. But in his case, he would never, if he bought a stock, he would only put it on a second loaf, so to speak, if the stock were higher than he bought in, or if he's shorting, he only shorts at lower and lower levels mm. because he wants the market to prove him right. So if he puts on whatever line he's he's putting on, let's say he puts on a thousand shares and he has a loss on that, he might just go ahead and stop out. But if he puts on a thousand shares and has a profit, then he'll peer, he'll keep pyramiding, but only at higher and higher levels. So waiting for the entry, buying higher, a little counterintuitive from what you hear on the streets, but mm -hmm. uh, that's the way that's the way to trade and that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. That's awesome. And I and I, you mentioned your series on Jesse Livermore, which is which is brilliantly done. Thanks for doing that. And Thank thanks you. for sharing that with our Stock Charts TV audience. It's uh, it's it's really, really well done. And I'll uh, keep tracking you doing those. Joe, what words of wisdom would you have? You've been doing this uh, for a number of years and you've seen many different environments. I feel like the market continues to reinvent itself. But at the same time, it's a lot of familiar themes that we've seen. How do you get through a period like this and stay, I guess, nimble or stay focused on the evidence when it feels like there's so many different narratives happening? Um, one of the biggest things that I've figured out, it took me a while to accept, is that there are good periods to trade and then there are bad ones. <laughs> and if you can reduce the amount of trading you're taking, the size that you're doing in an environment that this isn't as good, that you are you can really capitalize on the, the times when they are good. And so because you're not distraught, you're not like making money and then giving it all back. So to reduce the your exposure until we get a more clear sign that someone really wants, either this thing wants to work its way back down in a more aggressive fashion. And I agree with Mark, I don't think we're going to go to a new low or anything, but we could come down further or that it wants to 
to do something more meaningful to the upside and expand and broaden out. Once that happens, I think you, you all of a sudden you feel a lot smarter. You, you're like, oh, wow, I, you know, I, I'm actually know what I'm doing now. But it, nothing's changed. It's just the market's improved. Mm, that's a really good point. I love that comment about staying focusing on the evidence, right? Let the market kind of dictate when things are, are evolving. Mark, what words of wisdom or lessons learned can you share with us about sort of getting through a period like this, which certainly feels uncertain, where there's this anxiety, I feel like, about what may be coming next? How do you sort of stay focused and, and, uh, and, and ready to take the, the move when, uh, when you're compelled to do so? Well, I try to surround myself with charts versus news, and that's the big Ooh, thing. Look, we all have good. to manage our own emotions. And, you know, I, I think as Joe uh, alluded to, you know, there's certain times of the year when, when none of us are good traders and certain times when we're great traders, and we have to respect those times and know when we're overly emotional, when we're making mistakes, but also have a respect for stops that, you know, when are you wrong and are you able to say that you're wrong and get out of a trade that's not working well. And that's probably the most important because you just you never want to give back a winning trade. And you also don't want to lose and make justifications as to why you're staying in something that's not working. Uh, and, and everybody's done it, you know, myself included. So, yeah, know yourself, know your emotions, know your time frame of trading. Some of us are more, you know, better day traders. Some are more swing traders. Some are longer term. And just use that time frame of charts that really lines up with your own skill set. Uh, boy, this is like a master class in investing. I somehow got us to that point, which I'm super thrilled about. This is awesome. We only have a, a couple minutes left. Uh, Dave, I'd love to just ask, uh, when, you, when you were talking about Builder, BLDR, it, it, it just crossed my mind to think about um, you know, managing risk right, and, and sort of stops and how you sort of manage exposure in, an, in a name like this, which has had such a run and pulled back. There's a danger in, in any of these things when it's sort of pulling back that you're buying into weakness that all of a sudden you know, gets a lot worse very, very quickly. What's your general approach on a chart like this for managing the upside opportunity, but managing the downside risk as well? Well, when you have something like a, a wide range bar down, like that TKO bar, yeah. it becomes a bit of a textbook setup. So that just kind of, that lays out everything for you for the most part. So you dinner around 120, uh, stop a little bit above the bottom of the bar or below the bottom of the bar, maybe around 110. Mm -hmm. And then that gives you initial profit target 10 points up. So at 130, you're taking half your shares off and then you're trailing that stop up to break even. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's the crux of it. And then from there, you just let it go. Now, it is a little scary buying a stock that this is that is this extended. Yeah. And ideally, you want to find something that's just beginning to take off. But in a case like this, sometimes when you have that knockout move, you get a lot of shorts piling in. And then when it goes straight back up, the Johnny come lately is kind of all rush in or rush back in, whatever the case may be. The shorts aren't going to sell at new highs because they're smarter than the market. And if that market squeezes higher and higher and higher, then they're going to eventually get forced out. And that's sometimes when you have these TKOs go parabolic. Mm. Well, but that's just super, super helpful. And I appreciate you sort of clarifying that on a, on a name like this, which has had such a strong run. Guys, the pitch has come and gone. That's how quickly it goes. But this has been awesome. I really appreciate you sharing uh, not just five ideas each, but also some really brilliant uh, nuggets of investment wisdom. I think all of our viewers can really appreciate. Um, so Mark Newton of Fundstrack Global Advisors, Joe Rabel of Rabel Stock Research, Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com. Thank you guys each so much and for having a good discussion today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank Dave. you very much. Thanks, Dave. Guys, that was a lot of fun. Uh, this uh, series, The Pitch, is a really an opportunity to get inside the head of some top experts, technical analysts, and investors and just see what makes them tick, see how they're approaching a market. The good thing that I learned from this sort of conversation, this is a challenging environment, but there are opportunities out there. Think about risk versus reward. Think about staying patient. Think about focusing on the evidence. I think as Mark said very well, I forget the news and I surround myself with, with, I surround myself with charts. I love that one. Uh, so let's, uh, let's make sure you keep yourself surrounded with charts and focus on the evidence. All of our previous interviews and episodes of The Pitch can be found at stockcharts.com slash the pitch. So make sure you check some of those out. I'm Dave Keller with stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Be well, stay safe, and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay.